Now, at the southest neighborhood of Jerusalem, this neighborhood is called Gilo neighborhood, G-I-L-O, Gilo neighborhood. About 45,000 Israelis are living here, and it's part of Jerusalem, Israel, and all the houses that you can see in front of you are part of the West Bank. We are just on the municipal boundary of Jerusalem. This is Jerusalem, Israel, and this is the West Bank. If you look down the valley, you can see two roads first road second road and then you can see a wire fence down the valley a wire fence well this is the security fence well oops wherever you have seen the security fence in the media they always show you those concrete walls well there are concrete walls you can see some of them there on the mountain we will be there we will talk about them but please remember only five percent of this big project of 726 kilometers long, about 451 mile long, miles, mile, miles long, only 5% are concrete walls. All the other are wire fences, as you can see down the valley here. You'll never see them in the media. Well, the town that you can see in front of you is Bethlehem. On the top of the mountain, you can see the big hotel. If you look from the hotel to the left, you can see like a column between the trees. Well, this column is the statue of Maria that stands on the American University of Bethlehem, Freire University, very famous one. The Nativity Church is just behind it. So we cannot see the Nativity Church from here, but it's only two kilometers from here to the Nativity Church. Well, uh, till summer 2000, oh, Bethlehem used to be a Christian town for hundreds of years, as you probably know, uh, not anymore. In 1995, according to the interim agreement between Israel and the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, Israel let this area to the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian police went in, we went out, of course, and then the Muslims made very hard time to the Christians, so most of the Christians ran away abroad, and today Bethlehem is a Muslim town, only few Christian families are left here. On the other mountain here, you can see another Palestinian town. This town is called Bet Jala. In the center of it, you can see the big church with the golden dome and the big red roof. This is Skandar Khuri Church, very famous one. When the Christians ran away abroad, from Bet Jala, they even let the keys of the church to a Muslim. He still rings the bells every day, but he holds the keys of the church. So today there are only three Christian families left in Bet Jala. Uh, the neighborhood near us, this white neighborhood, if you look carefully in the center of it, you can see the mosque with the green dome and the minaret. Well, this neighborhood here is Al Aida refugee camp. Look carefully. This is how refugee camps look like in the West Bank. Not in Gaza Strip, not in Lebanon, not in Syria, not in Jordan. But here in the West Bank, all the refugee camps were repudiated and looked like this. Because the people that are living here are probably the grandsons of those refugees that ran away in the 48 war. Here they have equal rights as any other Palestinian, so they build nice houses, but still, they get, they hold refugee cards from the UN, they get once a month some food from the UN, they get a lot of free services from the UN, like free education, free uh, medical care, free water supply, free electric supply. I think that it's better that the UN will give these services to the real refugees in Syria, in Lebanon, in Africa and other places. But this is how refugee camp look like in the West Bank. Well, till summer 2000, there were very good relations between people to people, between the Israelis here and the Palestinians there. There was nothing between the West Bank and Israel. You can cross wherever you want, whenever you want. And in that time, a lot of Israelis were used to go every weekend to Bethlehem, to the holy places there, to sit there in the cafe, to have shopping there, to repair their cars or even to a dentist. A lot of people from the West Bank were coming every day to Israel uh, to work here, to have shopping here, uh, to the universities here. So one day, 
when the Palestinians start shooting from this area toward Gilon neighborhood, people were shocked. The first thing that I have done was to call my colleague in the other side. His name was Colonel Farid. I knew him for a long time. He was the commander of the Palestinian police in Bethlehem district. And I said to Colonel Farid, go and stop the shooting. You have here 250 armed policemen. You can stop the shooting in minutes. But Colonel Farid said to me, well, Danny, we are good friends for a long time. I'm sorry to tell you that if I'll send my policemen to stop the shooting, they probably kill me. And therefore he did nothing. So we had to bring our troops here. We put our soldiers here on the ground. And when the Palestinians were shooting, we tried to shoot back. But see in your own eyes, can you shoot back and be sure that you are not hitting innocent people? Even if you know that they are shooting from uh, the red roof house there, from the second floor, from the uh, third window. Can you shoot back and be sure that you are not hitting innocent people? The Palestinian terror, they try to hit the civilians, not the Israeli army. Because the aim of terror is not only to kill people. The aim of terror is to frighten the other side, to terrorize them, to make the, the life in the other side impossible. So the civilians will push the government to give them some political benefits that they couldn't get on the negotiation table. And therefore, the people that were shooting, they were not from the Hamas. The Hamas. They were not from some oppositional organization. They were from an organization that was called the Tanzim, the Youngers of El Fatah. El Fatah is the core party in the Palestinian side. Yasser Arafat was the head of the Fatah at that time, so he can stop it in one day. But he didn't. He used the terror as a tool in the negotiation with Israel. And we, the Israeli government, took decision that we are not fighting the Palestinian people. We are fighting only the terrorists. But that's a mission that the army doesn't know how to do. So the soldiers that we brought here ask us why you are bringing us to the front to a very dangerous place and you don't let us shoot. So we gave them an order. If you see an armed man that is shooting from the other side, of course, hit him. If not, just shoot above the houses to frighten them. But don't shoot directly because you can hit some innocent man. So it continued day after day. They were shooting, we were shooting, they were shooting, we were shooting. Just imagine what happened to such quiet neighborhood when they have been shot from the other side. At that time, they had normal glass in the windows. Today, you can see it's a green glass because it's protected bullets glass. But at that time, they had normal glasses in the windows. So when the Palestinians were shooting, most of them moved to the relative if they have some somewhere else in Israel. But then there were terror attacks all over the country. So they came back to their houses. Here, it's stone houses. So you can still live in the other side of your apartment. But all the apartments here were planned with big windows from the living room and the kitchen to where this beautiful view. So just imagine what happened in such of these apartments in evening time if someone needs something from the kitchen. Well, probably the wife will send the husband to bring it. But when he opened the refrigerator, there is a light. In a minute, you are the shooting from the other side. The life became here impossible. Even grown-up children wet their beds again. People were afraid to go out to work. People were afraid to send their children to school. The life became here impossible. So after a while, we brought here three tanks. We put the tanks here on the ground. And when the Palestinians were shooting, we shoot above the houses to frighten them. But it didn't help. So after a while, we took our troops and we get inside that area, taking back the responsibility of security from the Palestinian Authority hands to our hands. Well, we were there for about three years and it was very quiet. And then the American ambassador came to us and he said to us, well, we have some arrangement with the Palestinian Authority. You can be sure that no one will shoot. Get out. So we moved out from this area. At the same day that we left the area, a border policeman was shot just here in the street and we had to get, to get back there. We were there for another two years and then the Americans sent General Dayton to the area. General Dayton came here and after a while he brought staff from the CIA and they trained the Palestinian police. Not here, they trained them in Jericho and then we let them the area. Today we are out from this area. 
we are working in this side of the fence, the Palestinian police is working in the other side of the fence, and we have very good coordination with the Palestinian police. It's not cooperation. They are not doing anything for our sake. They are doing it for their own sake because they know that if someone will shoot, we will get in. And therefore, it's very quiet here and we have very good coordination with them. Uh, if you have been here till, I think, uh, three years ago, you can still see concrete walls that I've built around along the streets to protect people from sniper shooting from the Palestinian side. They were painted, painted very nice, but all over the streets I had to construct here concrete walls. After three years, it was very quiet here. We removed these concrete walls that people can live here normally. And I can bring you here and be sure that nothing will happen to you too. But this is not the reason why we built here the security fence. Well, before I'll tell you about the security fence, I want to share with you another story. You can see there on the mountain, there is a big house with a long antenna. <coughs> Down the hill, there is another refugee camp, very famous one, the Haisha refugee camp. This <coughs> refugee camp, the Haisha refugee camp, was rehabilitated by the help of the Japanese government, so it looks better than this one. But in 2002, there were three youngers from uh, the Haitian refugee camp that wanted to create a terror attack in Jerusalem. So they just took a taxi from the Haitian refugee camp to Lida refugee camp. They spent here the last night. They got here the cell phones, the explosive belts. They took the last night photos. And in morning time, when there were thousands of Palestinian workers that just wanted to work in Israel. So every morning, thousands of them were climbing the mountain here to work in Israel. It takes not more than six to eight minutes to cross it by foot. So uh, these three terrorists thought that they can get inside that crowd to Jerusalem. But in that morning, we had just in this small valley, five patrol jeeps of the border police. The order to the border police was not to shoot, of course. The order to the border police was not even to catch those illegal workers because we don't have enough courts, we don't have enough jails for illegal workers. So the order to the border police was just stop them and send them back to the West Bank. But when these three terrorists saw the border police here, two of them got cold feet and they went back to the refugee camp. One of them succeeded to get to the street there, to the bus station that you can see there on the street. He got on public bus number 32. The bus was crowded with children in the way to school. And he just waited till the bus came in front of the school. And then he blew up himself. There were 19 children that were murdered in this terror attack and 62 that were wounded. And everyone was shocked in Israel, not because it was the first terror attack, not because it was the biggest terror attack, but because this terror attack was intended to hit little children. This is not how freedom fighters are acting. This is how terrorists are acting. Well, at that time, the Prime Minister of Israel was Ariel Sharon. Ariel Sharon was a very famous a general in the army before he came to the politics. He was in his office in Jerusalem, less than one kilometer from the place that this terror attack took place. And he said to his people, I want to go there. I want to see it in my own eyes. He said to him, you are not in the army anymore. You cannot go to such dangerous places. But he insists. And they took him to the street. It was all bloody there. Some of the wooden wounded were still on the ground. And although he was in so many battles, he was shocked to see these little children. And in that evening, we were called to Prime Minister's office. And he shouted at us, I gave you all the budget that is needed. I gave you all the manpower that is needed. Why you cannot block the terror? And I asked Prime Minister, please come with us to the ground, see it in your own eyes and give us the right orders. So the next morning we were just here. You can see this round concrete tower there. Uh, it's about 100 meters from here. This is the southest Israeli outpost to where this area. It wasn't built yet. It was just a flat platform. We were standing there, the Prime Minister of Israel, the Mayor of Jerusalem, Elb Olmert, Olmert, that later became the Prime Minister, the Head of the Secret Service, the uh, Chief of Staff of the Army, the Chief of the Police, all the commanders of the area and thousands of Palestinian workers were climbing the mountain to work in Israel. 
and I asked Prime Minister, what do you want us to do? We are not going to shoot these illegal workers. We are not in the border between Texas and Mexico. We are not shooting illegal workers. Let us build some barrier on the ground that they will stay in their area. We will stay in our area. And if someone want to cross, he will do it through a checkpoint. Well, it took another two weeks. Another big terror attack in Natania, and the government took the first decision to let the army design and build a security fence. Well, and in that moment, I got the mission to be the head of this project. As the government didn't want to build it, the government didn't want to get inside the details of the root of the fence. So I was the bad guy that had to walk on the ground with my staff, define the right line of the fence and build it as fast as I can. Well, at the time that I was still official, still in uniform, a lot of VIPs were coming with me here from all over the world. Even Senator Hillary Clinton was with me here. When she came here, a lot of people from her staff were coming with her. Uh, a lot of uh, journalists, of course, a lot of guards, of course. And she said here very warm words about the right of Israel to defend herself, herself by building the security fence. Later, when she became the, uh, the Secretary of State, they took out from her website what she said here, but it's on the papers, you can read it, there is no problem at all. Uh, but just six weeks before that, I had here another senator, Senator Barack Obama. When he came here, nobody thought that he will run for the president, so only six people came with him. And when I told him the same story about these three terrorists from the Asia, he asked me a question. He said to me, well, you are talking about security, 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 and really you have a very good security story. But if you want to defend these Israelis, build a fence here near the Israeli houses, not near the Palestinian houses. Here it's less than 200 meters. In other places, it's more than two miles. So you are using the security story to take Palestinian lands. Well, a very good question. And I answered him, as I can tell you today, that the reason the defense is there and not here is a security reason. Well, how come? There is no fence in the world that you cannot cross. Even in Berlin, when they had those concrete walls with mines in the ground, electric wires, automatic shooting machines, guards, dogs all over the area, people cross the wall. Here we build a system. There are no mines in the ground, not electric wires, not automatic shooting machines. Uh, but we believe that you cannot cross it without leaving an indication. And from the moment that we get this indication, we need some space to run after the man and catch him before he gets to his target. If the fence will be here, we'll just know that someone is in, but we cannot help it. If the fence is there, we have some minutes, not a lot, but we have some minutes to run after him and catch him. So how this fence works? You can see that it's not only a fence, it's a whole system about 45 meters wide. It starts from the Palestinian side with a simple fence and a lot of barbed wires on it and red signs. If you look carefully along the fence, you can see in the Palestinian side some of these red signs. It's written there in Arabic, in English and in Hebrew, don't come in, it's a closed army area. So innocent people are not supposed to be in the other side of it, but it takes just minutes to cross it. Then there is a small ditch or cliff that no car can cross it. And then there is the fence itself. The fence is not electrified, uh, but it's a very sophisticated fence. There are a lot of sensors on this fence. Uh, it's about 3 meters and 10 centimeters high and it's built on a concrete belt that is inside the ground and there are sensors there that if you touch it, if you cut it, if you climb on it and even if you come with some metal near it, it gives a precise indication where and what's going on there. At the moment that we get this indication, the cameras that we have all over the area are moving and we can see what's going on here. You can see there on the top of the tower there are two cameras day camera and night camera. The next cameras are there on the white red tower. So we, the day camera can see for seven kilometers. The night cam camera can see for kilometer and a half. So we can see, is it a child that runs after his ball or it's a terrorist that want to cross the fence? 
at the moment that we get the indication, three forces are running. One force is running down there, the other two patrols are running up here, so we can close the area and catch the man in his way. That's the whole system. Well, then you can see on the ground there is five meters wide of a dirt pass between the fence and the asphalt. You can see five meters wide of a dirt path. We are cleaning this dirt path twice a day. Once in the morning, once in the evening. So if someone steps on it, he leaves a footprint on the ground. And that's another sign for us. We have trackers on the patrols. They know to read those signs and it works very good. Uh, the patrol road. Uh, <clears throat> the order to the army and the border police is to be in five minutes to any call. I'm talking about 451 miles long, 726 kilometers long, and they have to be in five minutes to any call. So we need a lot of forces, but we need a very good patrol way that they can run very quickly to any call. Then there is another fence in the Israeli side, again with a lot of barbed wires and red signs, that it will take some minutes more to cross it, and there will not come some innocent men from the Israeli side to that area. Between the barbed wires in the Palestinian side and the barbed wires in the Israeli side, we use another kind of rules of engagement. We are not shooting a man if he's inside, but everyone that is inside is suspicious, of course. Well, at the first month, the Palestinians test us. They test us in daytime, they test us in nighttime, they test us in wind time, in fog time, in rain time, and the fence is very, very effective. So today they are not trying to cross it. Maybe uh, 20 to 25 times a week they are trying to cross the fence all over. <clears throat> but every night, every night till today, we catch between 5 to 20 terrorists in the West Bank in the way to the fence. As you probably know, Israel has a very good intelligence. So if we get a piece of information about some Palestinian that intend to do something, if it comes from area like this, what is called Zone A, under the full responsibility of the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian Police, we are not entering the area. We are letting this information to the Palestinian Police, but we are watching that they are doing their job. If it comes from Zone B or C, where Israel holds the security a responsibility, we are working there and we catch these people and we bring them to court in Israel. Of course, if they're found guilty, they are going to jail. If not, we are sending them back to the West Bank. Just in 2013, I don't have the statistics of 14, but 2013, uh, we stopped 80, 80, oh, 80 suicide bombers in the way to Israel. Just imagine, we are living in Israel, you are now in Israel, the life in Israel is calm, is normal, uh, is free. 80 terrorists suicide bombers try to cross from the West Bank to Israel in one year. And they are stopped by the border police and the army and the secret service that works here 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, all over the time. Uh, so as this fence is so effective, today we sell this system all over the world. Even when I was in London, I want to see how they protect the Buckingham Palace. And when I went there, I saw on the fence the Israeli film sign. Uh, just nine months ago, uh, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, Homeland Security in the USA made a very big contract with an Israeli company to buy the technology uh, for uh, the border uh, control uh, of five billion American dollars. Uh, I don't know why they are not using it in the White House. You see so many times people are entering the fence there, but it's a matter of proud maybe that they are using it there. So this is the security fence. Let's go to the walls and see why concrete walls and how we are working with concrete walls.